Yeah, let's get into it. There's a ton happening uh, in the space, obviously. And uh, what's exciting is to learn from, we have both rising star companies, which are those that are relatively new, uh, have less funding overall than some of the others. And we have, uh, uh, that's, and then best in class, some more mature companies. So we're going to hear it from a, a blend of them. We're going to kind of just mix them up in, in the mix as we go. And I think in no particular order, I'm just going to uh, 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 call uh, in an order of folks I maybe know a little bit. I'm going to start with Bill Chernek over at Rocket Doctor. Uh, he's been doing some make great progress in Canada and beyond. So for each of the companies, we're going to ask him to uh, do a quick intro, maybe 20, 30 seconds about what you're doing, and then ask, ask answer the kind of core question of how do you see your diagnostic solution evolving and making impact over the next five years? Over to you, Bill, and then we'll go to um, uh, Gaurav Patel. Great. Um, thanks, Daniel and everybody. Um, great to see this group also. So my name is Bill Cherniak. My background is in emergency medicine, trained in family practice and global public health as well. And I'm the founder and CEO of Rocket Doctor. So um, as we heard, lots of digital health companies. Way to frame us in your mind is we're like a Shopify for physicians in that we enable doctors to build and create independent virtual care practices but then we organize hundreds of physicians together into a system of care that we direct at to patients predominantly in rural and remote communities and folks on Medicaid. And we build all the software that powers that whole system and marketplace. And then we marry our tech with AI-fueled digital health technologies, Bluetooth-enabled medical devices, and really a telemedicine 2.0. So we've seen just about 300,000 patients and have over 300 physicians on the platform. Um, and in terms of how... We're seeing ourselves in the next five years, I guess, for access to care. Is that kind of the idea how we're going to change sort of healthcare delivery? Sure. What do you see evolving with your platform in the next five years? Yeah, I mean, I, I think key for us is how we engage with um, the 90 million plus Americans that are on Medicaid in order to increase um, access to care while also empowering physicians to not just have to use a really clunky sort of platform that um, is challenging and difficult and built for coding, but rather built for the practice of medicine. And so how we can, you know, enable doctors to actually enjoy the practice of medicine virtually and build a really great care continuum to improve access to care for patients. So that's our core focus. Thank you. Uh, over to Cognita Labs, Gaurav Patel. Hello, everyone. Nice to, uh, thanks for inviting us. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Cognita Labs. My name is Gaurav Patel. Uh, we work with patients uh, with pulmonary conditions, chronic pulmonary conditions such as asthma and COPD. Uh, we focus on uh, gaps in care delivery that's, uh, that we see today often with the patients and providers. And we focus on three areas. One is to uh, en enable and facilitate early diagnostics. Second is to address suboptimal inhaler use, which is a huge problem. And then third is to come up with the new biomarkers that can predict early exacerbations. So by focusing on those three, we, we work to improve patient engagement and improve outcomes for patients. Uh, we have two FDA clear devices, class two FDA clear devices, and uh, our devices are being used by more than 15,000 patients in 12 countries. So that's a super quick introduction. Um, talking about how we plan to um, really change the field and help the, uh, the stakeholders in the next five years, uh, the remote diagnostic and remote patient monitoring is clearly moving forward. I think there are a lot of uh, successful stories coming out in different disease conditions, uh, but there are also friction points. I'm sure a lot of companies are aware of things such as patients stopping to use devices, patients not being compliant after a few months. Digital fatigue is real. They stop using their apps uh, after a few months. I think there are specific pointers that we uh, come in and we help with uh, pulmonary patients and especially asthma and COPD. Um, there are also a lack of sensitive biomarkers when it comes to chronic respiratory conditions, unlike glucose and uh, uh, diabetes and hypertension. There are no clear biomarkers that can help you predict what is happening. And sometimes patients are not even aware that they, they are experiencing exacerbation. So we come up with those markers and we help the providers and payers also. Uh, to really fill these gaps. So uh, we think that the market and then the industry is moving forward. And I think there are friction points if the startups coming together to really fill in these gaps, I think it will uh, truly benefit the patients and providers. Outstanding. In terms of uh, filling in the gaps and connecting them, let's go over to Validic and Drew. Uh, I know Validic's often been connecting the dots amongst many platforms and diagnostics. So let's hear for what you guys are up to as one of the uh, best in class. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Appreciate it. Great to see you. And um, so, yeah, so Validic, so we capture personal health data from what's happening in people's everyday lives and bring it into the health system to enable better, more proactive care. 
Um, we have the largest health IoT platform out there, over um, 580, I think, approaching 600 disparate connected sources today. And we're continually adding more everything from you know blood pressure, weight, pulse ox, thermometers, CGM, wearables, health apps in the phone, like you name it. We wouldn't be able to capture data from it and make it relevant for clinicians. And to sort of get to your question, Daniel, the way I see it is, I mean, bottom line, I think probably the reason why we're all here is more people need more care <laughs> and, and we have fewer clinicians to actually deliver that care. And that's going to be something that just continues um, on in the future. And um, the way we really look at this is that we're sort of in a different world today than we were even 10, 20 years ago, where we now live in sort of this era of personalization, where we all expect companies to deliver personalized experiences. You know, think about you know, what you watch on Netflix, like the next thing up is something based on your algorithm that's that's tailored to you. Or if you buy something on Amazon and you, you know, the next time you log into the app, like there's a recommendation for something that you may not have even known even existed. Um, but now you need it because it's a really cool thing. Like, and that's, that sort of personalization is really key to our consumer experience. And um, McKinsey actually um, has a stat that 71% of us expect those personalized experiences um, when we're interacting with companies and 76% of us get frustrated when we don't, um, when we don't receive them. And what's really interesting about that 76% number is that um, 70, according to HEMA Foundation, 76% of us are frustrated when leaving their medical appointments and they're frustrated because they're not receiving personalized care. So they leave feeling like they didn't have their questions answered. They didn't feel heard. You know, they feel like they need to do more research online, like ask Dr. Google and that is a, a terrible experience. And um, and as we know from our from being consumers, it's easier than ever for us to choose something different. And 69% of people would leave their healthcare providers for one that provides a better service. And so, like this is a world where consumers are starting to have more power, and they're starting to recognize it. And so, we as a healthcare system need to be able to start delivering more proactive personalized experiences, but also recognize that it needs to be done in a way where clinicians can actually be more effective with their limited time. So the way that we're sort of evolving into that is first and foremost, by understanding what's happening in people's daily lives, you can help prioritize the care that you give. So you can know that folks are doing okay and prioritize the folks who really need more care. Um, you can uh, bring the data into the clinical workflow. So it's part of the everyday experience that a clinician has when they see patients. Um, and that's a really key point that it's not something more to do. It's just a way for them to do their job better. And that's a big part of what we do. Um, and uh, just to kind of name a, a couple of stats that are really important um, around that is that nine out of 10 physicians say that our program saves them time, um, which is really huge when you add a digital health tool and it actually saves them time. Um, there's also, uh, we actually ran a program in a cardiology clinic that showed um, that the care team was able to go from evaluating six patients an hour to evaluating 12, 20 patients an hour without compromising clinical care. So they could do in two hours what used to take them a whole day. So these data not only provides better insight and personalization for patients themselves, but it also enables the care team members to be more effective and efficient with their time. Great. Thanks, Drew. Um, over to Adar uh, in Baltimore, I believe. Now we moved to Colombia, so come visit us. <laughs> uh, I'm Satya, founder and CEO of Adar Health. We are a data science and medical device company. Um, we aim to reimagine today's standards for disease management. Our, our mission is to just extend life. I mean, we wanted to extend life and improve um, the quality of life of patients with chronic conditions. I uh, started it to help my mom, and today, again, we're helping thousands of patients uh, who are using our device. Uh, we have our first uh, device. It's a FDA-cleared, CE mark-approved, uh, ISO and MDSAP certified device that measures around 12 health parameters in under a minute. Um, what we're doing is we're not just collecting data. We are actually turning data into actionable insights, and uh, Mouth Lab creates more personalized indices, predict risks, and empowers providers providers to make decisions faster. Um, I think personally, uh, what this has been rewarding for us to see actually, for almost seven years, we've been telling the importance of measuring multiple parameters uh, at the same time. And a lot of people ask like, why? I mean, I have like one or two parameters continuously, that's good enough. 
But today we have shown that actually measuring multiple parameters at the same time uh, has significantly improved uh, prediction, uh, help us to identify early signs of uh, health deterioration and hospitalization, and also helpful for us to manage patients who have like other chronic conditions. So, and also from an AI or machine learning perspective, right? Um, a device like Mouth Lab measuring multiple parameters compared to two or three parameters, uh, which gives a quick snapshot of somebody's health, gives us more value and also empowers uh, preventative health. So we don't have just a device, but also have a platform for physicians and also for um, which connects into the electronic medical record. So essentially, we're providing an end-to-end -end platform to help um, care managers uh, manage their patients. And also, right now, we are getting a lot of interest from uh, nursing homes. So we are supporting a lot of nursing homes uh, to manage multiple patients and provide uh, more impact on a daily basis. Great. So just to clarify, this is a device you put in the mouth and pulls down multiple vitals, right? Just to yeah, visualize yeah. it. Exactly. And and I think uh, just to answer your other question, like the current ability of our device to measure around 12 parameters is only the beginning because of the access to breath and saliva. Um, we have uh, building like at least another 20 different sensors which can go into our device. So it's essentially uh, we created a fictional Star Trek tricorder into a device. Long and prosper. Great. Yeah. Uh, next up is uh, uh, Sh uh, Sriri. It's really great to meet you all. Uh, so my name is Sri. I'm the founder and CEO of iMetrix. Uh, we are, uh, we can hands down claim to be the best in class when it comes to mobile cardiology, uh, because we are the only one that actually supplies a diagnostic grade mobile uh, device today. There are a number of consumer devices like uh, that you can find in an Apple Watch and all, but in mobile cardiology, we are the only uh, diagnostic EKG device today. We've served over 500,000 uh, patients, all the way from emergency situations and including in a, like a very cutting edge example, a motorcycle ambulance in India and Israel. You gotta, you gotta see to believe it actually, a STEMI patient on a motorcycle. So we deployed around the world and we don't go to market directly mostly, but that's why nobody hears about us. Uh, our telecardiology solutions are deployed through Medtronic, Philips and uh, Siemens primarily uh, around the world. And right now, uh, you know, going forward, uh, you know, we've been mostly in preventive uh, care in, in one side, in one side, and the other side is basically emergency and chronic care. So it's been all over this place. But moving forward, what seems to be the biggest vector for us in the U.S. and outside is really uh, telecardiology networks, kind of tertiary care to secondary care to primary care, and then into homes. It's kind of sp spreading like a bicycle, like a hub and spoke model all around. So that seems to be spreading. Our current programs with uh, just Medtronic and Philips target about uh, 10 million patients uh, in the next uh, five years. So those are these are kind of long-term programs uh, that we are on. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's only 160. What we built is really an engineering marvel, I think. That's why I call it best in class. It's equivalent, to, for those of you who are physicians, is the equivalent of your $16,000 to $25,000 cardiology machine. And uh, it kind of uh, does, about, weighs about 160 grams and works with a very, very simple, even if a $50 Android tablet could, uh, and anybody out there, uh, with, if they can use WhatsApp, they can use that ECG device to produce clinical care. So that's been our uh, kind of accomplishment to date. And we are very affordable. We are very accessible around the world. People have uh, used us. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm going to spare you guys the data story for now. With 500,000 patients, it leads, uh, you know, it, it's a long story. So, but thanks. I'll keep it brief for now and uh, pass it on to the next person. Okay, great. Uh, I will uh, take it from here for a little bit. So uh, next up, we have Zandar uh, and Sam Yang. Hi, everyone. Um, so we're Zandar Cardian. And this is our product. It's a radar device. So we've been doing this for about 12 years as a company, six years. Uh, the uh, short intro is we're all about compliance-free health monitoring. So using radar, we collect nano vibration pattern from the body, and we're able to get body motion index and resting heart rates and resting breathing rate. And I like to emphasize on the resting because with radar, unlike wearable devices, we can actually scan from head to toe. 
and make sure that you're not moving and then collect that uh, information. Uh, basically, we're collecting about 6,000 measurements of resting heart rate and breathing every single day per patient. Again, no wearable, it's in the ceiling, it's in the wall beside your, your bed, and basically it's collecting all that every day um, on and on and on. What happened is, what's really exciting is, from last year, we had 30 sensors deployed in three pilots. This year, already in the past nine months, we have 7,800 sensors deployed, of which 4,000 are in skilled nursing facilities. The big reason why is because using our data, we were able to predict early deterioration on average two days before onset of symptoms. So COVID, before they had coughing, before they had fever, our vital sign detection was saying, wait a minute, your baseline was this, and now you've been constantly changing. So why is that? So we would flag it, and our remote patient monitor companies will actually initiate a testing based on the environment as well as the patient's uh, history. So our data is sent to uh, the PCC, which is the EMR of uh, many uh, skilled nursing facilities. And I think what's really exciting is five years from now. So that big question about where is it heading? We're considering this as just being the tip of the iceberg. And we're really just getting that initial stage. Um, we're moving from long-term care facilities to aging in place. So that's why we have this home device ready and also eventually chronic care management. And all this massive amount of data that we're collecting, we're gonna be able to train the AI models now in order to have more powerful predictive care. So not two days that we're getting today, but five, seven days, even 14 days in advance of an event. So that's where we're heading with our technology. Sam, that's really exciting. Um, one of the things that I hear from people all the time in this kind of segment is, is the data only when the patient's in their room, if it's in the sensor in the ceiling or wherever it might be, or yeah. can you follow patients throughout the day? We, that's a very commonly asked question. Uh, and we actually, actually asked that ourselves. We're like, oh, wait, we need one in the kitchen, in the living room, in the bathroom. So we're not a telemetry device. We're not a purse device, right? So even though when we're collecting from the bed for eight hours, we were already collecting 6,000 measurements. So our main focus is on that trend alert not a sudden uh, event. So the, to answer your question, we didn't have to. We don't have to follow you, you know, 24 hours a day. There's other devices out there that can do that. Our device is for compliance-free, automatic uh, monitoring on a day-to-day -day basis for trend. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks for clarifying that, Sam. Uh, all right, let's move on then to Wesper. So Amir. Hi everyone, my name is uh, Amir Uveni from Wesper, and at Wesper we build the most comprehensive platform to diagnose and manage sleep disorders from home. Um, as you may know, sleep is a huge problem in an enormous market because it's very, very difficult to get help, get diagnosed, and, and manage your chronic condition. I know it firsthand since my father had suffered from sleep apnea for more than 20 years but couldn't get the right help that matches his condition and lifestyle. And like him, 1 billion people in the world suffer from sleep apnea. 80 to 90% of them are undiagnosed and untreated. Um, just so you know, having a chronic condition, uh, a chronic sleep disorder uh, like sleep apnea increases your risk for diabetes, heart failure threefold, and can reduce your life expectancy by 10 to 18 years. Uh, so we build an expert team, an amazing product that focuses on the patient experience on one hand, while improving the physician workflow uh, with almost no learning curve. Uh, so adoption is very, very quick. We, quick. Uh, we launched in March uh, our uh, medical device, and we're now growing about 50% month over month. Uh, the product is very simple. This is like a, a flexible, simple wireless patch that collects more than 18 uh, different sig signals and deliver them to the physician. Um, you have a patient experience through the app and uh, a physician interface that allows them to review. Uh, we have three pillars that makes our product very unique in the marketplace. One is the superior offering. The second is the data that we collect. And the third is the AI models that we uh, develop on top of it. Superior offering, we're FDA cleared. We have three FDA clearances for a disposable and a reusable version of the product. We have 25 patent portfolio already, uh, 11 already granted. And the device is already reimbursable for any fee for service uh, for hospitals and for clinics. The data that we collect is very specialized for sleep, pulmonary, and cardio. 
um, high resolution, 18, uh, 18 high resolution signals, raw data that physician can review, but we also deliver it in a very friendly way to the physician. So we can encourage uh, and improve outcomes and we can collect data longitudinally. So it's not only we start with the remote diagnostic, but we really want to take it uh, into a longitudinal data set. And by now we arguably have the largest uh, longitudinal clinical grade data set on sleep. Uh, the last piece is really developing AI models that we already have models that uh, analyze waveform and detect the type and the, uh, the severity of apnea. Uh, we can tell uh, many things about your sleep phases, your sleep position, uh, and we are now developing AI sleep expert and a treatment prediction that can, based on the data that we, we see, we personalize what is the, the best uh, therapy for you. In the next five years, um, we want to take sleep medicine from a very episodic fee-for-service diagnostic model to something that is more longitudinal and outcome-based. Uh, so with our platform, uh, we'll be able to uh, track, monitor, um, and uh, improve the outcomes over time. Uh, we are now working on contracts in the value-based uh, arena, uh, which there are no uh, real players there in, in sleep. Um, uh, because we saw that by treating sleep disorder, you can actually reduce the total cost of care by $4,000 to $5,000 per year for Medicare patients. So that's a very uh, unique angle that we bring to the field, the ability to not only diagnose, but also provide a full service and uh, uh, that is driven by outcomes uh, for uh, sleep medicine. So thank you for, for the opportunity. Thanks, Amir. That was very comprehensive. I'm going to move on then to our next company, um, which is going to be Rune Labs and Brian. Hi, thanks. Yeah, I'm Brian Pepin. I'm the CEO and founder of Rune Labs. We are a software and data company uh, that enables precision medicine in the massively underserved neurology market with a strong focus on Parkinson's. In that context, we are the developer of the most popular software for um, care management in Parkinson's called Strive PD uh, that strongly features an FDA cleared Apple Watch um, integration for monitoring Parkinson's symptoms, but also uh, includes a lot of data hooks into healthcare records, medications, um, and other device data. Uh, we bring that to data directly to the patient to help them um, better manage their care at home, uh, as well as package it up for the clinician, especially around um, advanced therapy uh, matching patients to advanced therapies and managing them on kind of complex care regimens. Uh, that has given us this great uh, patient network where we have the kind of the primary relationship with the patient and uh, direct access into that patient clinician relationship. We've built a nice high margin uh, pharma facing business um, from that patient network and then the data there uh, serving both clinical development and commercially approved therapies. And we are uh, in the process of building a care management business, partnering with some large MCOs around per patient per month models uh, with the goal of uh, really reducing hospital utilization first and foremost, but also kind of managing uh, specialist utilization in those practices. Uh, the, one of the things I'm most excited about right now, kind of looking forward is now that we've had the network up and running for a bit and have some historical data We've been developing and are now deploying some of the first data-driven features um, for patients. Uh, the, the one that's gonna be first out of the gate is um, a symptom forecasting model. So it's taking a, a couple of the key Parkinson's symptoms, tremor and dyskinesia that we track continuously and actually forecasting that out an hour into the future so that we can trigger alerts for patients um, that are relevant to them sort of taking more or less of their core dopamine medication doses or maybe taking a rescue med or even just kind of being careful and not getting in the car if it looks like they're going to have some off time. Uh, so I'm excited about that because, it, you know, it's something that truly um, couldn't have existed before without this data. It's something that is going to uh, offer something brand new to the Parkinson's population in terms of uh, actionability for their, for their care. And it's something that I think is going to uh, help us keep growing uh, what we can do on the care management side and um, help us keep growing our pharma business by growing that patient network as well. So, um, yeah, that's us, Rune Labs and Strive PD. And just a quick question on your diagnostics. It's simply around the tremor on the wrist picked up by the watch, or are you evolving past that? Yeah, so the 
The symptom forecasting that I mentioned specifically focuses on tremor and dyskinesia. Uh, we also bring in a lot of other relevant Parkinson's symptoms in the sort of universe of, of bradykinesia, so slowness of movement, uh, balance, um, things like that. Uh, and I think importantly, we tie a lot of that to people's sort of medication regimens and schedules um, and look to see how they're responding to doses, are they compliant? A lot of that ends up feeding into should they be on a more advanced therapy or should they just be managed better on the current therapy with dosing? Um, and uh, yeah, and then of course, tracking that over time with circadian cycles, with progression of the disease, um, all relevant for the for care and for the pharmacide. All right, terrific, Brian, thank you. Um, let's move on then next to Intermedica, Informedica and Amanda. Yeah, thank you everybody. And it's great to be amongst so many wonderful companies. So thank you for having us. I'm Amanda Burry. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer at Informedica. Informedica is a 10 plus year old company that really focuses on taking patients from symptom to outcome. So to date, we've done over 14 million health checkups for patients worldwide in 30 countries and over 24 languages. Uh, our engine accuracy is over 94% and we have third party clinical validation. And so you might say, what does that all mean? We've heard that before. Well, Informedica takes it to the next level where we take patients through a virtual triage that allows them to go from symptom to outcome. And we triage them through five levels uh, of different triage. So when you're at home, it's all about delivering care outside the walls of a four hospital. We know that there are limited cl clinicians and limited time. So if we can give people the ability to find out what's going on with them on the go, whether it's on their mobile device, inside a patient portal, like an Epic MyChart application, or maybe they're part of a, an outreach campaign, we allow them to check those symptoms and then be connected with the right level of triage and right level of care. In most cases, two thirds of patients follow our advice and we're saving thousands of unnecessary outpatient visits and also emergency room visits. And so to date, we're working with about 100 plus customers. Uh, primarily, we work with integrated payers, telemedicine companies, and we really focus on specific workflows. And we really want to focus on meaningful ways where we can take the burden not only off the clinicians. So whether that's reducing, you know, their inbox messaging and making the uh, application part of their workflow or giving patients the comfort they need to know what is wrong with them when and where they need it. Um, we also really focus on providing value and demonstration to our customers. Um, we want to make sure that we're building trust, and we do so by having a fully certified medical device uh, CE marked. Out of our 200 plus Informedica um, colleagues, about 60 of those are clinicians, and they've spent over 80,000 hours of clinical review and clinical work that have taken our AI engine and also given it that human empathy layer that helps provide our customers with the trust that they need. Um, our bold vision as a company was always to provide this virtual PCP or this virtual caregiver. And we thought maybe that would happen in five or 10 years, but with generative AI, we're coming even closer to our bold vision. So for us, uh, we are not walking, but we are running towards the future and ensuring that we can connect patients with the right level of care and also follow our mission of reducing costs, providing accessibility and convenience to patients globally. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Um, great overview. We're going to get into some more details on the next round of questions. So uh, let me move ahead then to our next company here. So I think we've got uh, Hume up next. Huma Therapeutics, uh, Kaushik. Hey, uh, I'm Kaushik from Huma. I lead uh, Huma's US business. Uh, Huma was founded in UK um, and served NHS for several years. Uh, we are present in UK, Germany, and US as of today. Uh, and what we are is we are a digital first company. We have, over the years, we have built uh, three platforms. Um, one is a screening platform that helps patients uh, do their screenings, health checkups, so on and so forth. Uh, we have a disease management platform. Uh, that typically is used by you know, patients who are dealing with chronic conditions uh, or even patients who have had an uh, acute episode and are trying to recover and get back to their normal life. Uh, and then we also have a clinical uh, trials platform. Uh, 
Um, earlier this year, we um, got our approval uh, uh, class to, to be in Europe and 510K in US as a disease agnostic configurable platform. And that was a major breakthrough for us because uh, we were able to convince the regulatory bodies that uh, we truly have built a massively configurable platform uh, by which we submitted about 400 plus you know, unique uh, deployments, data from 400 unique deployments. And we were able to convince that uh, if, if we can configure a solution for you know, 400 unique cases, trust us that you know, the 401th unique case comes in, uh, we, uh, we will meet the standards of efficacy and safety uh, that, that one needs to. Um, we have about 2 million uh, active users uh, across our platform uh, and about uh, 30 million registered users that do a bunch of different stuff um, on our platform every, every week, uh, every, every month. From a diagnostic perspective, um, up until now, you know, we started our journey about 10 years ago. And at the time, we were focused on simple stuff. And even today, that's, it's not yet solved. But we were doing simple you know, screenings and health checkups. Uh, compliance to those things is you know, abysmally low even today after you know, having so many um, uh, technologies. And slowly, we evolved into you know, cap doing remote patient monitoring, uh, capturing you know, different sources of data whether it's vitals or patient reported outcome uh, and helping, uh, uh, helping our providers uh, identify at-risk patients. And so over time we started developing th that. Uh, and then recently we got into you know, predictive uh, uh, algorithms and predictiveness. So can we predict you know, based on all the information that we have through our screenings, through our monitoring platforms, uh, can we predict the next exasperation that a COPD patient may have three days ahead of time? So that's what we are doing today. Uh, I think where we see, you know, um, in five years time, uh, we expect to achieve like a really massive scale. Uh, we have a partnership with Bayer to screen about 100 million uh, US lives using our uh, cardiovascular risk score. We are today at 1 million. So achieving scale is gonna be a primary uh, big importance for us. Uh, and with partners like Bayer, we have set a very you know, big goal of 100 million. Uh, and then second uh, piece I see is using more and more of AI uh, to do not only prediction, but also recommendation. So you know, we're not only a platform that says, hey, something's wrong, but what should you do in the moment so that you, know, you can take uh, quick action? Uh, there are tons of use cases that we are currently working on. Uh, asthma, you know, COPD, the data exists out there. Um, we did not have the computational capability. Now that exists. Uh, we just need to, you know, execute fast enough uh, so that we can bring uh, this uh, potential to the market uh, in a safe uh, and responsible way. Thanks, Kashik. And I think last but not least, amongst all our opening companies is uh, Vivalink. Over to Sam. Thank you. So I'm Sam Liu, VP of Marketing at Vivalink. So Vivalink took a little bit of a different approach to uh, digital health and remote monitoring. Instead of picking a specific therapeutic or diagnostic area, we focused on building a biometric data platform that can be used to develop virtually any kind of application and quickly get to market. What we did was we integrated medical wearables and sensors, along with network data services and algorithms, into a platform so that any company who's building novel applications can quickly develop and deploy the solution to market. You can think of it as sort of an AWS for RTM. And so we launched this uh, two years ago, and to date, we have about 300 organizations that license this platform, and they represent 45 countries around the world. So it's pretty surprising how many companies are out there in the world that are building novel applications for digital health and remote care. In terms of you know, where we're going in five years, so we're definitely in a growth stage right now. Um, but we see a lot of transitions happening in, in the area of uh, digital health. A lot of the uh, remote care models have been centered around, I would say, chronic condition monitoring. 
but more and more we're seeing acute care, acute monitoring. And so for acute monitoring, you fundamentally need a different infrastructure in place, something that's more akin to true hospital at home scenarios where patients may need to be monitored continuously for a period of time or sometimes in real time. And so that's the direction we see, you know, in terms of where things are going in the next five years. Great. Thanks. Thanks to all of you for sharing your uh, core vision and where you think you're going. We got about 20 minutes left. So we want to kind of go into a rapid fire mode, like short questions and short answers, like a minute uh, or less for your answer. Um, and Paul and I are going to riff on these. I'm going to start with one. I'll start with uh, Drew Valitic and I think Bill at Rocket Doctor. One around sort of the issue about all these new forms of data, but it's still all about workflow, both for the clinician and for the patient. And maybe, uh, Drew, you've been at this for the longest. What have you learned about making this data actionable and useful, not just another uh, button to click. And then uh, to Bill on how do you see physicians leveraging these in their day-to-day -day practice? Yeah, totally. So rapid fire, right? So first and foremost, if it feels like one more thing to do, it's never going to work. So, and you get one shot, you get one shot to engage a clinician. And if it didn't work the first time, they're not going to give it a second shot. So like, you got to really nail the experience, like treat the clinician as a as a core user, as opposed to just an afterthought. Um, and the second thing I'll say is when you're bringing data in from lots of different sources, there's oftentimes thoughts like, well, what if they see things, you know, they don't want and they start ignoring the alerts. Like if, if you're surfacing up escalations for the clinician that they don't want to see, you've set up the program wrong. Like clinicians should be thanking you for escalating the right readings for them to review and if you've not done that, then the program was set up wrong in the beginning and you got to go back to the drawing board and reset something up so that they're thankful for the tool. Yeah, I think so my side, I think, was on how to use the data for doctors um, more specifically. And I think this has come up a lot, actually, in discussions with different people, which is you've got all of these devices and all of this data. And perhaps there are now, you know, not perhaps there are AI tools that are coming out that will use that data in ways that maybe we can't even understand how it gets to conclusions that it does. But um, at the highest level, I agree a lot with Drew and it's really straightforward also, which is don't give a bunch of data to a doctor unless you know how it's going to impact clinical outcomes or to a provider of some other sort, because the last thing we want is just to see a flood of information with no clue what to do with it and how to actually change patient management. So I think that's the key is how do you actually use that data to impact clinical outcomes? Perfect. And Sam Yang, you wanted to jump in on this one too. Oh yeah. You know, when it comes to actionable and alert, there's got to be the right balance because the last thing that nursing staff needs is too much alert, right? Alert fatigue. Um, what's really interesting for us is we've been doing that whole uh, baseline change alert. So we call it the POC, probability of change line, uh, change from baseline. 69.2% of our alerts has been actionable. So it's super interesting how, um, you know, all of this monitoring can derive that actionable, um, you know, change in the, in the healthcare. All right, let's go to uh, a couple additional uh, panelists here. So uh, Amanda, um, let's talk about a specific example of how a patient uh, has been successful in managing their care with your solution. Yeah, thank you. So I think two ways. Um, number one, our tool not only is used by patients and, and members as part of programs, but clinicians are also using it. So we have to take a mindset of really focusing on specific workflows where they can be successful. And we need to meet patients where they are. So one of the ways that we've done that is by focusing on a specific workflow um, as it relates to the Epic MyChart application. Clinicians, nurses are overwhelmed with Epic inbox messages. We were able to create through our triage technology a way for those messages to be cared for automatically, triaging those patients to lower level acuities of care, freeing up close to 2,000 appointments for higher acuity patients that needed to be seen by the physician. So not only are we keeping the patients pocket um, uh, pocket padded a little bit more with uh, lower copays, um, but we're also ensuring that the clinicians are being connected to the patients when and where they need care. So for us, it's really all about focusing on those, those workflows and then also finding an AI champion at your customer or at, at with uh, your partner that you're working with. 
Um, it's really critical that on the, the clinician end, they're reviewing, and uh, Drew said it great, that if, if they can't understand where the data is going and how it's going, it's no use to the patient or the provider. So for us, it's really all about um, not just you know, replacing clinicians or replacing uh, people workflows, but it's how do you hire AI to help augment um, the clinical workflow workforce so that they can treat patients when and where they need it. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Amanda. Let's move on then to uh, Brian at Rune Labs. And again, maybe an aha moment, something that, you know, again, patients were, you know, something you saw and observed in the way patients we're, we're using your service and, and how that has impacted their care. Yeah, um, I think one of the aha moments that we've had more broadly is just that taking a very patient-centric approach here is, is important. I think if you want to change any element of healthcare, clinicians are important partners, but if they're in the critical path, you're probably in trouble because they're going to be an overall more conservative group of folks. Um, and so I think we've taken that approach. One actually, an example just comes to mind. So our chief operating officer, her mom has Parkinson's and, uh, like many, um, you know, sons and daughters of people with Parkinson's, she, she has gone into the, the clinic with, with her mom to try and, uh, make sure everything is taken care of. And they'd be going into the clinic, you know, quarter after quarter, uh, and her mom has been getting worse and they'd been kind of upping the, the level of medication and it'd been continuing to get worse. And she joined our company, immediately had her mom start using our product, uh, and then came in with that, armed with that data during the next visit, and then realized that um, the symptom that was actually getting worse, dyskinesia, was not the symptom that they thought was getting worse from talking about it with the doctor and describing what had happened at home. And in fact, the what a doctor would do in those cases is sort of opposite. So if you have dyskinesia, you actually want to provide different medication or lower the levodopa dose, and they've just been increasing it. So armed with that information, they completely reset her medication schedule. And um, yeah, and she basically was doing much better immediately uh, with her symptoms. And um, that that's common. And I think what, what I like about that is it is an approach where we really empowered the patient to do something. We, you know, we trained, that clinician was trained to look at the data, but we empowered the patient to like take the initiative. And I think that that's core uh, to our approach. Okay. Thanks, Brian. I guess the question I'll start with for Sathya at ADAR and then maybe to Amir at Westbur is a lot of diagnostics now are not just a single metric. Like with uh, with uh, your mouth diagnostics, you're not you're lots of vital signs and other data. And I assume Westbur, you got beyond just respiratory rate and, and you have sounds and other data. How do you see about integrating those data sources to making meaningful? What have you learned maybe in each of your platforms uh, to advance that to make it uh, actionable? No, I think uh, specifically for us, uh, we're doing a large uh, initiative with the VA health system right now. And today, uh, like unlike other solutions, right, where you actually give one or two dev devices or like different boxes, like heart failure, here's a box, COPD, here's a box. Uh, we actually provided our device. And, and uh, for example, a patient with hypertension uh, in the last 40 days, he has been went to the ER twice and then got hospitalized once. And everybody thought it was because of uh, his uncontrolled uh, blood pressure, but he was going to the hospital due to breathlessness or which was actually shown in our device data through uh, the respiration rate and then also the lung functions and other parameters. So what we're really working on is like not just taking this data objective data, but we also validating subjective data that is coming from the patients and then using that to escalate to the physician and, and risk stratify them because it's not about just providing data dump, but it's also providing indices or like specific data points. So we're collecting all these information. We are presenting it to the physicians uh, in a more meaningful way, and they make the decision to escalate the care. So we have seen like such amazing examples, and, and we were able to, of course, diagnose a lot of conditions, but we, we are going through a lot of FDA submissions right now. As we move from device, we're also doing a lot of software as a medical device submissions in the next few months, which will all be focused on algorithms to predict diseases, which will then be used by physicians for long-term monitoring. Uh, in our case, I mean, we developed the, the really the most comprehensive uh, solution for sleep disorder in the market. And we measure in addition to um, respiratory rate that you mentioned also position, uh, respiratory effort, airflow, um, you know, sleep phases, et cetera, which really allows the physician to determine what is the type 
of the of the disorder is it related to a neurological condition a pulmonary condition etc uh, one of the unique things that we already have seen uh, in the industry is um, the ability to titrate and manage sleep disorder over time if you think about it the standard was going to a sleep lab so you have a very episodic uh, way of diagnosing and, and basically that's it the patient is left alone um, one specific example, there is a, an implantable device uh, that can actually improve your uh, breathing, uh, but it takes six to eight months to titrate and adjust it uh, for a patient uh, because you need to send it to a, phys to a sleep lab, coming back, lots of money, very frustrating process. Uh, by using Wesper uh, during from the diagnosis all the way to monitor the, the outcome of this device, the physician could reduce it to two to three months. So it's really an amazing uh, solution that can really wrap around uh, any any type of therapy uh, for a physician and the patient. All right, so uh, let's get to uh, a couple of, uh, you know, again, inspirational stories here. I wanna hear examples of something maybe that was unexpected that you observed in the earlier phases that now you've leaned in on hard and you're, you know, you're, you're rallying to support in a much bigger way that's helping you scale. So for this, let's go to, uh, let's go to, I guess, who haven't we covered so far? Uh, I guess we haven't hit uh, Huma Therapeutics and after Huma, let's go to, um, do we do Validic yet? If not Validic uh, and I can pick somebody, if not go Huma. Yeah, I think for, for me, the, the, the most inspirational was uh, more around kind of the impact that we are having uh, in rural America. So, you know, we, uh, we were talking with this pharmacist uh, in, um, uh, in Prosperity, South Carolina. This is a town of, you know, 3,000 people. They have like two doctors in the entire town and one pharmacist. Um, and this is really, you know, um, I think a lot of uh, insurance and, you know, other healthcare providers call this area as the healthcare deserts of, you know, America. And if you look at kind of the patient demographics, almost 60% have, you know, hypertension and, you know, chronic diseases. So the health stats are, you know, completely inverted um, when you look at, uh, you know, this population. And I think what we were able to do is, you know, because of our configurable platform, uh, we actually deployed a disease management solution in the pharmacist uh, location. And one of the things that we realized, you know, I, uh, and a year ago, I was thinking, will this even work? You know, how, how will this work? And I said, I'm just gonna make a trip and see what's on the ground. And when I went there and I walked in, uh, the two things I realized is one, there's an immense amount of bond between the pharmacist and every person that walks in. Um, you know, they know them by name. They probably go to the same church, same soccer practice, so on and so forth. Um, and the second thing was uh, they cared for their patients so much that they were calling on their patients even after they left the pharmacist to check up on whether they took their medications they would ask the patients to come back in and take you know, the blood pressure reading. And I turned, out, turned around to my team and I said, this guy is doing you know, digital health and you know, remote patient monitoring and disease management. Just, he just doesn't have all the tools. Uh, you know, he's just doing it you know, in a very, very manual way. Um, and so that was you know, uh, kind of an humbling experience almost, which made me feel like, if we can't have an impact here, then I think we should quit jobs and you know do something else. Um, so I think that was most inspirational for me, uh, just because it brought so much value to people who don't have you know basics that otherwise we consider uh, we assume as normal. Great observation, Kashik. Okay, so let's let's keep going. The last couple uh, panels here. I want to make sure we get to you. Um, so uh, Valeric, could I take that one too, please? Uh, I'll keep yeah. it short. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, we are in cardiology in the business of life and death. And I walked into uh, this head of uh, Indian uh, Council of Medical Research office. And the one question he asked me, he said, uh, you know, people can't get to an ambulance, can't get to people on time. And I can only send a motorcycle. Would it work or not? And nobody ever, would, you know, and they've tried 22 devices at that time, but, you know, in, in the world. 
And we said, look, if we can tune the filters for you if you don't, uh, if they don't work. And we made it work. Uh, it's 6,000 patients saved so far using, I, I know, and STEMI on a motorcycle. It was very, very humbling for us to actually tune the device to make it work. But, you know, and we lay uh, our story on accuracy. And if I had to give you one short answer in our business, it's accuracy, right? We live and die by that. Awesome. Uh, I'm happy to provide a really short answer. So uh, uh, early early days for us, we had a gentleman named, uh, named Steve. I have permission to share his story, real person. Uncontrolled type 2 diabetes for over a decade, overweight, depressed, had to quit his full-time job because he just didn't have the energy. He's going for his quarterly checkups It is with his clinician, always had an A1C over 9, um, and he was trying to eat healthy. He's trying to exercise more like the doctor was suggesting. He would even show the doctor his glucose numbers on his phone. And the doctor's like, I don't know what to do with this, Steve, but like, I'm telling you what you're doing is not working. Like, let's adjust your insulin and metformin and we'll try, try again next quarter. Right. And it just was, he was getting sicker and sicker. And so Steve left and went to um, another health system that happened to be using Validic to bring data into the clinical workflow. So first appointment, Steve hooks up his glucose, read, his glucose meter to the app. So his data can go into the EHR. Next appointment, he shows up, the data is already there. So now the nurse sees the data and the nurse says, hey, Steve, I'm seeing you're tracking your data really well. That's great. I'm seeing you're tracking certain times a day, but what's going on in the evenings? Because your glucose levels are high. He's like, oh, nothing. You know, I'm just having a little snack. She's like, well, what's, you know, I'm watching Netflix with my family. Well, what's your snack? Oh, it's not, it's fat-free, sugar-free. It's no salt. It's just plain popcorn, like plain pop. It's healthy. And she's like, I don't know if that's healthy for you. So he cut that out. Within 30 days, his A1C dropped by half a point. First time he'd ever had a meaningful uh, health change based on something he had, uh, an interaction he had with his clinician. And that led to an ongoing series of discussions with the clinician over several years based only on the data, where now he's lost 50 pounds, he's exercising daily, his A1C is A1C's below six, um, and he's organic gardening, like he's completely turned his life around. And that's a model that made the, it didn't, was no different for the clinicians. They were doing what they already do just with better data, but it's a massive improvement for Steve. And, and it's, he's actually, it's led him to be less of a, of a utilizer, utilizer of the healthcare system because of it. So we use that as our core story. Thanks, Drew. Awesome. All right. So let's keep with the same question for uh, our last two, at least one more panelist here, and maybe we'll sneak in one more. Uh, Cognita, Goro. Same yeah, question. it's a pre pretty much the same story. I think we hear the inspiring stories interacting with patients. And when we interact with patients, we learn a lot. Uh, so early days when we started Cognita Labs, uh, we were, so we are from Rice University, world's largest medical center is across the street. Uh, we went to PFT lab, which is a diagnostic lab for asthma COPD. And we learned that there's a three months waiting time. So you wouldn't imagine that in Houston, but that was a true story. So we realized that we need a simpler, uh, simpler tools in more in primary care and more point of care situations. Um, long story short, that's what we worked on and that uh, to really bring it to uh, the point of care situation where we can reduce the burden in hospitals. Uh, but when we talk to patients, we learn a lot of inspiring stories. For example, when we, uh, we work with the patients for remote patient monitoring, and then uh, this is the physician's view. So that this is the protocol where the inhalers don't work. They are supposed to, supposed to switch the inhaler. So we have patients where they keep switching the inhaler every three to four months, and they keep switching to a higher dose, higher, um, of higher expensive versions. And then we hook up our data and data is power, right? You empower uh, providers with more data. So we hook up our sensor and we teach them how to use inhalers. And they immediately realize that they've been using inhalers incorrectly. So they correct that inhaler use. This does not involve the provider, just that they now empowered with this data. And we see the shift in lung function. It goes up and they become controlled in about three to four months. And we have seen this repeatedly again and again. Even the GINA and the gold guidelines say that, hey, you need to check your inhaler technique first before doing anything else. But it's hard to implement. How do you check inhaler use when patients are using it at home and you cannot call them every week? So that's been something that's a good, uh, good to see when we provide the information. And similar things are happening to COPD patients as well. When we show them the data that the providers are not getting, it's all subjective. They, they answer the questionnaires. They, uh, they show that, hey, I'm well, I'm well, I'm well until the day before the exacerbation. And that's a sudden uh, shift in exacerbation. Uh, the symptom score, it's hard to catch. And then we provide these devices that's been traditionally provided in hospital settings 
that shows the slow change in lung function, uh, and you, which you can detect seven to 10 days before. And that provides the power to the providers and also the nurses to, and, and also surprisingly to patients as well. Our patients, uh, we thought that they won't be so interested in data, but we are learning again and again, they want to see what's happening with their health condition that really engages them. So again, a lot of inspiring stories we have working with the patients. Uh, they prove us wrong about our hypothesis about what we have, uh, but uh, that's that's the main part, learning from the patients. Yep, patients included. And uh, last word, real quick, goes to Bill at Rocket Doctor. Awesome, thanks. Um, my take's a little different, which is from the provider perspective. So um, we all know the rampant burnout of physicians these days, not wanting to practice medicine um, and finding it very challenging, particularly uh, myself and my eMERGE doc colleagues. And, um, you know, uh, emergency physician on the platform came to me two years ago and said he was pretty burnt out and frustrated with bureaucracy at his hospital because he wanted to help patients he was seeing coming in with addictions, medicine issues. So, you know, alcohol, opiates, amphetamines, and the, you know, strings that were attached and the politics, and you just couldn't do anything when all these patients kept coming in. So we said, hey, great, we can help actually to support you in building something on the platform. And then managed to, because we're a platform, we were able to bring on, you know, family doctors, internal medicine specialists, addictions doctors, GP psychotherapists, psychiatrists, so prescribers as well, and sort of integrate that whole care team with care coordination into a system that's now seen 3,000 patients that they've helped get off of all those different substances um, and do, you know, an acute phase, like nine visits in a month and then hand off once stabilized. And so that's kind of the neat power of an integrated platform with care coordination and then um, leveraging all those different aspects. We really empower doctors to practice medicine. So um, that's my story. Anyways. Thanks, Bill. And to all of the uh, finalist company, I noticed that both Rocket Doctor and ADAR were uh, many winners at the Next Med Health Awards that uh, that Paul and I run. So uh, we're, we're doing something right. Uh, but big picture, this field, I think, is ripe to move us from our you know, traditional sick care model of intermittent data and reactive models to one of much more continuous data and insights that can hopefully democratize healthcare uh, in the U.S. and around the planet. So uh, thanks to all of you for what you guys are doing. Congrats on being finalists. Uh, it's You've made it through a lot of hurdles. founder and CEO at Validic. Everything in our lives today is personalized. What we watch, what we buy, and 71% of consumers expect companies to now deliver personalized interactions. And 76% of us get frustrated when this doesn't happen. What's interesting is that 76% of patients are frustrated when leaving their medical appointments. And they're frustrated because they're not receiving personalized care. Patients leave feeling confused about their health. They don't feel like they're getting their questions answered. They need to do more research online, like Ask Dr. Google. And as we know, when consumers don't like the experience they receive, it's easier than ever for them to go somewhere else. In fact, according to a Harris poll, 69% of patients would switch providers for better services. At Validic, we created the only solution designed to help clinicians efficiently deliver personalized care for all patients. Our superpower is that we make the personal health data from people's everyday lives available as a first-class citizen of the EHR. So with one click in the patient chart, clinicians can quickly enroll patients in care programs and any clinically actionable notification is available in the clinical workflow in basket or via in-basket pools. Nine out of 10 clinicians say Validic saves them time because they have accurate, timely data available in the patient chart. And our clients have seen a 63% decrease in the amount of time clinicians spend on the phone with patients, and 75% of patients feel like they're receiving better care. The US has an aging population where more people need more care, and we have fewer healthcare workers to deliver that care. 150 million Americans could benefit from remote care programs today. And technology is the solution. However, most programs out there are 50 or 100 person pilots. Validic should win because we are all about scale. We power the largest personalized care program in the country with Kaiser Permanente. There have been over 350,000 patients enrolled by more than 7,000 clinicians, covering programs from type 1 diabetes, type 2 gestational diabetes, hypertension, heart failure, and more. 
And the secret to the operational success is that Validic is deeply embedded in the clinical workflow across seven regions of Kaiser Permanente, which is about 20 Epic instances. We'd love the opportunity to share more about how personalized care is a better care experience for patients and makes clinicians' lives a little bit easier. Virtual patient care is transforming the healthcare and drug development industries. However, implementing an end-to-end -end application solution is complex, requiring multiple domain expertise. Introducing the Biometrics Data Platform by VivaLink, consisting of medical-grade wearables, edge-to-cloud networking, and data services, all designed to accelerate the implementation of healthcare applications, including virtual clinical trials, ambulatory cardiac monitoring, and remote patient care. The Biometrics Data Platform enables patient-generated real-world data collection and analysis for diagnostics, care delivery, and research-based applications. And with edge-to-cloud data integrity that reliably handles network disruptions, even in remote settings, all of that data is automatically synchronized from the sensor to the cloud for data analysis and central management. The Biometrics Data Platform is device agnostic and is also optimized with VivaLink's medical-grade wearables, which are reusable and patient-self-serviceable. Most importantly, they capture continuous and episodic data with options for live data streaming or recording. VivaLink works with more than 100 customers and partners in 30 countries around the world, including world-class organizations such as AstraZeneca, Pfizer, MedPace, LabCorp, UCSF, and more. tell you one of the greatest success stories in Polish history. Welcome to the age of Informatica. In the year 2050, there's a story I'd like to share of a revolution in the world of AI and healthcare. The tale of Informatica, a name known far and wide, they transform patient care and turn the healthcare tide. It began in 2012 when their tech whiz CEO had a vision to change healthcare to the ends of the earth he'd go. It was Informedica that emerged with a vision so profound to streamline the healthcare journey for every person around. The company of Informedica created a solution that became the norm. It transformed the primary care pathway. It's the medical guidance platform. Their solution empowered doctors clinical support that they could trust and for providers, hospitals and insurers for their patients, it was a must. With their symptom to outcome solution, their clinically valid AI was unfurled. With 24 different languages, they empowered patients around the world. With personalized medical guidance, the healthcare pathway became more clear. Whether patients needed telehealth, self-care, or ER, the clinical support was top tier. But the real Informatica superpower, it's not just AI learning, it's their team's dedication that drives them a deep and passionate yearning. They are a team united, dedicated to the healthcare revolution, their 84,000 hours of physician work helped create innovative solutions. Their medical guidance platform, powered by the team's heart, they have a global mission to change healthcare's chart. With 224 staff, it's the team that paved the way, relieving the burden on the healthcare system every single day. In 2050, as we look back, it's very clear to see the transformation of healthcare in Formatica's legacy. So let the Digital Health Award recognize the company that changed the course. Informatica deserves the crown as the guiding revolutionary force. Huma is a highly flexible disease management platform or remote patient monitoring technology. It's in principle available for any disease pathway to help you manage patients through their, any disease agnostic to that abolishing the need for, for point solutions. But actually, Humus technology is much more than that. It's about flipping the default and helping people take care of themselves at home, not having to go into hospital or clinic all the time, but taking control of their own health. Humus superpowers actually to give superpowers to healthcare professionals, to help them manage many more patients using intelligent predictive algorithms generative AI and other tools. It enables you to manage your patients even when they're not in the clinic, not, not in front of you, to manage them when they're at home, to help them manage themselves. 
Ultimately, human superpower is about doing much more care with less resources. Human should win this award because it, it, this sort of technology will replace a completely outdated way of doing healthcare. Bricks and mortar healthcare, going to clinics, going to hospitals, the inconvenience of that, the lack of safety involved with that. But also because it addresses workforce problems all over the world, the United States included, where there's too few nurses and healthcare professionals, our technology enables them to do much more care with less resources. But ultimately we should win because it helps people patients to take control of their own health and to get ahead of illness to predict it before it happens. Hello everyone, I'm Satya, founder and CEO of ADAR Health. ADAR is more than just a company, it's a vision to reimagine the way we manage diseases, conduct clinical trials and enable aging in place. We design and develop clinically validated software and cutting edge biosensors, all with one goal in mind, to improve the quality of life and extend life itself. Our flagship product, MouthLab, is an FDA-cleared CE Mark approved handheld device that measures more than 10 vital health parameters in under a minute. Our superpower is our speed of prediction and turning data into actionable insights. MouthLab is not just about numbers, it's about creating personalized health indices, predicting risk, helping healthcare providers make informed decisions at a very early stage. MouthLab is essentially like a check engine light for humans. Our patented technology captures rich digital and biochemical biomarkers that no other technology can match. So we are transforming our understanding of human health and diseases. We believe ADAR should win this Rising Star Award because we're not changing the game. We are reinventing the rules of healthcare and rewriting the way we manage diseases. We showed our platform can improve patient care, empower healthcare providers, and reduce healthcare costs. And we don't do this alone. We have industry leaders who share our vision and work together in bringing clinical care and clinical trials to patients' home. Please join us in our journey to make healthcare more accessible, more equitable, more personalized, and more effective. Thank you. Hey there, my name is Gaurav Patil and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Cognita Labs. At Cognita, we are significantly changing the way respiratory conditions such as asthma and COPD are diagnosed, managed and monitored at home. And to do so, we are taking evidence-based approach. We know that patients often struggle to use their inhalers regularly and correctly, which leads to drop in their disease control. Uh, more importantly, patients are often not aware of the disease control until they experience the sudden onset of symptoms which leads to hospitalization or ER events. So to fill these gaps in the care, we are helping patients and providers with our device innovations. For example, our first device, Capmedic, accurately measures exactly how patients are breathing through the inhaler and then it guides the patient step by step in real time to improve the inhaler technique. So it engages me and it gives me actionable feedback right when I need it. Our second device, PulmoScan, is the first small airway function monitoring device for home use. Typically, these devices cost more than $10,000 and they are meant for hospital or clinic use. Uh, it measures a very sensitive marker of airway obstruction and that has a huge utility if you deploy it for home monitoring. So we are very different in our approach. Uh, instead of throwing large amount of patient data at clinicians, we try to solve the core problem at its root. For example, our patients significantly improve in their technique without any clinician intervention. Second, we bring in sensitive biomarkers such as inhaled parameters or small airway lung function collected at home. With better data, we can train our ML algorithms better and that means early prediction of events. Uh, for example, in our COPD study, we could detect COPD exacerbation about a week early. And we are increasing this evidence size, working with some of the largest provider and payers in the country. But most importantly, 
our patients love using our devices uh, they love interacting with them and they just have to spend a few seconds a day and that is our biggest strength hi my name is richard merritt and i'm the president of cardian health i've worked with large medical device companies for over 20 years but I've never seen a team like the one here at Xander Cardian, combining cutting edge research into radar and deep partnership with clinicians to make sure that the solution actually simplifies workflow for clinicians and has the economic and clinical evidence behind it to be adopted widely. Let me tell you about the XK300. It is the first and only FDA cleared commercially available radar that can actually measure heart respiration rate and heart rate as compared to the gold standard of entitled CO2 and ECG. It's totally automatic. There are no wearables, no interaction required by staff or patients. In addition to vital signs, it continuously collects patient presence and motion data, which when you combine with AI and machine learning can create remarkable new insights for clinicians. Its range goes from 10 feet to 33 feet, giving great flexibility for placement in the room or bathroom, and it could go through blankets, clothing, furniture, and even drywall. But what about the evidence? Published studies show that respiration rate and heart rate are two of the most important predictors of patient deterioration, but because they're difficult to collect continuously, they're really underutilized by clinicians today. In this graph, you can see just one example from a long-term care facility for an otherwise healthy 89-year-old patient that we were able to see a trend more than three days before an acute event and a hospitalization that could have been prevented. In 2022, we're focusing on long-term care where staffing challenges are extreme and we have the opportunity to give back 17% of the time clinicians spend on routine tasks such as bed checks, focusing on time on the patients who need the most care. In summary, we have three key value propositions, including clinical outcomes, bringing existing remote patient monitoring reimbursement to long-term care where it's never been used before, and reducing staff strain and burnout. I'm Brian Pepin. I am the founder and CEO of Rune Labs. We are a precision neurology company. Uh, so we're working to bring, bring predictive medicine uh, to neurology with a Parkinson's first approach. We're trying to make it work in Parkinson's first. We have a, a digital care ecosystem called Strive PD, involves software that patients use in their home, in their normal lives. Uh, it's software that clinicians use, a web dashboard they use inside a visit and a lot of data infrastructure also that uh, kind of powers everything and that makes that data available to, to researchers. And that all together um, allows us to bring data from clinical practice together with um, new data that's generated by our Stripe PD app, as well as our Apple Watch integration, which we recently got a 510K approval for Parkinson's symptoms on. Bring that together in a clinical visit to surface patterns that maybe aren't normally visible and help clinicians deliver therapy that goes beyond uh, one size fits all. So help them deliver and manage complex therapies like deep brain simulation, help them match folks to clinical trials, for example, for, for stem cell therapies, and, and also just help um, manage kind of first line medications, combinations of medications, and, and really get to better patient outcomes. Uh, we got our start at UCSF, uh, where actually our office is located just down the hill in uh, Inner Sunset in San Francisco. Uh, they've been our first partners for research. It was the first place we launched Drive PD. It's where we've been the longest. Um, and that's kind of where our spiritual home is and, and where uh, a lot of the, the 